At Sam's Club, you get incredible savings every time you shop. And summer savings just got a little sweeter. Stop by your local Sam's Club and pick up limited time offers, like three pounds of red grapes for $4.98. That's just $1.66 per pound. And six packs of Sabra hummus and pretzel cups for $9.98. Keep tonight's dinner simple with a freshly prepared chicken parmesan and pasta dinner. Serves four for just $5.18 a pound. Join and save. Sam's Club. Life is better in the club. See club for details. Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to True Crimes Podcast. Today I have a very interesting guest, Jen Wood. Jen Wood is a trial reporter who covers high-profile trials across the nation. With a background in criminal studies, she has been pursuing her fascination into how our criminal justice system works. She has witnessed many trials over the years, some more high-profile than others. Some of the trials that she has recently covered are James Holmes, Jody Arias, Richard Chrisman, Marissa DeVault, Stephen DeMocker, and Brian Wayne Hulsey. She has appeared on many news channels, including HLN, Nancy Grace, Jane Velez Mitchell, and Dr. Drew. She she was also a news correspondent for Arizona Stations and has appeared on crime shows Snapped and Discovery ID. You can follow her on Twitter at Trial Diaries J., and visit her website at thetrialdiaries.com. And you also have a Facebook page. I have it all linked underneath the podcast of, um, let me see, Facebook at Trial Diaries, The Trial Diaries on Facebook. Hi, Jen. Right. Thanks for being on Hi. the True Crimes Podcast. Thanks for having so, me. So you're very busy. Going. How long have you um, been covering trials as a, you know, I actually started officially covering trials uh, by creating a blog and writing on them during the Jody Arias trial. Um, I went there because I was a criminal justice student, um, and I thought, you know, I want to go see this trial. It's one of the biggest trials happening. It's in my state, and I want to go check it out. And so I ended up um, watching a lot of the first trial and decided I wanted to blog on it and give my spectator's point of view of the trial rather than more of a news point of view. I thought I could give a little more insight. So that's how it started. And how, yeah, uh, and how did um, how did you notice the differences? I mean, what were the big, did, it, did the news just sort of miss a lot of what was going on or they just focused on one or two things? And Right. The news would give like an overview of the case and then add maybe a paragraph of new information where... Um, I could give a lot more details, like what the jurors were doing, what the spectators were doing, what the families were doing, uh, what, you know, the defendant was doing. I could give more of a a bird's-eye view of what was going on in the courtroom, and people loved it. I, I I was working with a partner at the time, and we were so excited. We had 35 views on our website. We were just jumping up and down celebrating and it really took off, and we ended up having around 20,000 views a day on that website. And um, she ended up going her separate way. I went my separate way and broke out with the trial diaries. But it all began during uh, the Jody Arias trial. Yeah, that was that was a big one. That was a, um, yeah, very prominent trial. Um, it was. So, and actually, actually, I want to ask you. So, you do live streaming. You have a live streaming uh, account you can sign up for. Now, do you record the trials yourself? Are you sitting? With- no, I don't. I don't record them. I'm able to link directly to the news organizations that record the trials. So, my website is like a one-stop shop. You can come there. You can link right up to all the trials. You can read about the trials. Um, there's even a place, you know 
the public can even give me their own stories about trials they've been involved in and or you know if they've been a victim or a def- um a lawyer I just have a section they can talk about trials too so I always link up to what the latest trial is and so I always have that available and then I archive it on my website also so if you miss the trial you can always go to my website and watch it later wow that's great yeah, um, it's a trial. It's a trial junkie's dream. <laughs> <laughs> I see, and I, and I read some of the things that people have written on your website. You know, that, and I, I'm, I'm interested, very interested in true crime. But some of these people are, I don't know, obsessed. It seems like they take days off from work just to watch the verdict, and <laughs> they'll really they really you know, do. There's a really big trial community out there that's really invested in these trials. They you know, watch them religiously. I actually was one of, you know, I am one of those people. I didn't really watch soap operas. I was tuned into court TV. That was, you know, something I watched religiously. And it's the same group of people that are just really invested in it. And there's a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Now, now, uh, the trials, do you mainly just want to do, what kind of trials do you cover? Is it only murder trials? I cover criminal Criminal trials um, is what I like to cover, and I'm always looking for a good one that can, you know, capture an audience. And sometimes I've, you know, I've covered trials that weren't live streamed where I've just had to purely uh, tweet through the trial and write about the trial, and they have just as much interest as a trial that's live streamed. So you just have to pick a trial that you think will capture an audience that everybody wants to follow along with you and um, it's great it's a great community thing that we all do together and watch and you know you sit there and try to guess you know okay did this defendant really do this I'm looking at this evidence as if I were a juror and so you try to figure out if this defendant's really guilty or not Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah, it's it's very uh you get very you can get very involved in it and very and, and do you talk to the families at all or do you ever get to talk to any of the witnesses or anything on your own or I have developed a relationship um with some of the families and some you just don't. You're considered, you know, like a media person. The families don't wanna talk to you. you know, you know they're they've got their own thing going on. But I have gotten involved with a couple families that I had a really close bond with during the Richard Christman trial. I got really close to the victim's family. We sat on verdict watch together for weeks. Uh, I got to know each one of them. By the end of the trial, you know, we were hugging each other, and they were just a really great family. I really um, enjoyed getting to know them. I wrote an article about them, what it's like to sit through verdict watch with a victim's family, just how painful that is of the waiting and the, the stress of it. Yeah, so, uh, tell, so tell us about the Richard Christman trial. That was a, an interesting one. He was a police officer who, for 10 years, he never fi- fired a shot, and then one night he was uh, involved, answering a domestic violence call for a man that was high on meth, and he shot him and killed him. Right. It, it was actually a really high, stressful trial. They had the police union was really involved in this trial, they had the officer that was with Richard Christman saying that Richard Christman shot this guy, you know, in cold blood. And then you have Richard Christman saying he was defending himself. This guy on meth was trying to attack him. So the police union basically stood behind Richard Christman and the officer, the other officer, the partner, uh, was basically being called a rat. And he had to get on the stand and testify against Richard Christman And I remember, you know, Richard Christman had all these police officers on his side of the courtroom, and this officer that had to testify against him had maybe two. And he had threats against his uh, life. It was just a really dangerous uh, situation for him to speak up. And it was a really good trial. Uh, He actually wasn't found guilty of murder. He was found guilty of aggravated assault and... I believe he took a plea deal because they were going to retry him uh, for manslaughter. So he will be out in probably less than seven years, maybe three or four. 
Wow, that, that must have been intense. I'm, it I'm was wondering really though, intense. Could, it was really intense. Yeah. Oh, well, so you were there, and you could actually see the people. And what was your feeling on it? Did you feel that the that he was guilty, or what, what did you? What was your take on it from watching everything? I did. I did feel that he was guilty of being a little trigger happy. He shot the guy's dog, also killed the guy's dog. Um, the other officer, I really believed him. He said the guy was cooperating, um, and this, you know, Richard Christman was just a little trigger happy. But then again, you know, they did tase the def- the victim and it didn't really work. And it was just really, who are you going to believe, one officer or the other? Um, Richard Christman got on the stand and testified on his behalf and was crying and seemed really remorseful. But he had a past of misconduct. He had actually put drugs on a homeless woman and it was caught on videotape. And so that didn't come up in the trial, but he did have a past of misconduct. So it was hard to believe him. Ah, I see. Okay. All right. And how about there was another trial you covered, Marissa DeVault. She killed her husband with a hammer. And another another person, last name Cook, falsely confessed to this crime. Right. This trial actually was even more interesting than the Jody Arias trial, and it just really didn't get enough speed in the media But fascinating trial. I mean, it had everything. It had, you know, the defendant was a stripper. She was having affairs. There was a sugar daddy involved that was giving her up to, I can't remember how much it was, over $300,000 throughout the time they were together. And there also was a man, a cook, who had a short-term memory issue, and Marissa DeVault was trying to convince him that he had murdered her husband, and he was believing it because he has this memory issue. He confessed to it. But the evidence just did not point to him doing it. It pointed directly to Marissa DeVault. And she was just that manipulative person that she would actually try to get this uh, roommate that was living there in the home put in prison over this. Wow. wow. Yeah, that was a big trial. Yeah. yeah, she didn't get the death penalty. It was a death penalty case. She um, had her daughters actually get up on the stand who were very young, maybe 8, I think 10, uh, maybe 13, and then there was one that was 18. Uh, there, might, there might have been just two younger ones, and then one that was 18. They got on the stand and pled for their mother's life, and it's actually what, saved her from getting death row. I had interviewed uh, Jor after the trial, and he had said that 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 played a big role. Wow, yeah. Right. Okay, okay. But she's in and we're kind of seeing life, that basically. with James Holmes. We're kind of seeing that with James Holmes now. He's had his sister testify, and we're going to be seeing the parents testify later. And when family members testify on behalf of their um, you know, children that are on trial, it does have an impact on a jury. Right, because right now Holmes is, he's already been found guilty of murdering these people, so now it's just whether or not to go to to get death or not, the death penalty. Right. Okay. Right, and, you know, he has a mental illness, and you're going to have, you know, the sister was on the stand, he's telling the jury how much she loves her brother, and she wants to see him and write to him, and still be able to maintain a relationship with him in prison. So that that can weigh on a juror. All it takes is one. And I'm wondering, too, because, you know, there are all these stories going on. You, co- you were covering about how crazy he was, basically, eating um, cups and <laughs> just doing... Oh, my gosh. Yes. <laughs> I mean, he, he was mortified, but now the jury things. found him not... Yeah. But they found him sane, well, right? They Right, because they found him sane during the crime. He had done so much planning of this crime. He, uh, you know, all the gear he bought, well over, you know, $10,000 worth of stuff that he bought to commit this crime. The planning, he had written things down in a notebook um, that he had sent to one of his therapists. All the evidence pointed to he was sane during the crime. He knew right from wrong. It's, It's the legal definition But he does have a mental illness. It doesn't change that fact. And so the jury did everything right. 
he he was found guilty not by insanity but now that we're in 